Hi, hello and welcome to the second lecture in the program analysis course. So in this second lecture, we will look into operational semantics. Um, the lecture will be uh, composed of five parts. And this is the very first of these five parts. So let me um, start by looking at the big picture. So in the last lecture, we have uh, looked into what programming languages actually are, because programming languages obviously are at the foundation of program analysis. And we had looked into how one can define the syntax of a language, for example, using a grammar. Um, we've also looked at different representations of programs written in these languages, like abstract syntax trees or control flow graphs. And what we want to do in this lecture today is to look at how we can assign meaning to programs written in a language. So this meaning or semantics um, can be defined and we'll use um, operational semantics as a way to define the meaning of a programming language. All of this will be done in the context of imperative languages. There are other kinds of languages, for example, functional languages, which we will not look at here in the course, but instead we focus on operational semantics for imperative languages. In a sense, these operational semantics are a formal foundation for specifying languages and also for describing program analyses, which is why they are relevant um, for this course. Just to warn you, so this um, lecture will be probably the most theoretical of the course. Um, if you like it, great. Uh, if you do not like it that much, stay tuned because um, things will get a little bit more applied and practical after this lecture on operational semantics. So here's a rough plan for the lecture. So we'll start, uh, and this is what I'll do in this first part of the lecture, with a motivation. Why do we actually need operational semantics? And then I'll give you some preliminaries, uh, basically formal um, concepts that we'll need in order to describe operational semantics. Then we'll describe the syntax of the language that we'll use in this lecture, which is called SIMP. It's a simple imperative programming language. Um, so this is a toy language, but nevertheless interesting to look at, in particular for the purpose of formally defining the semantics of a language. And then we look at three different ways how we can actually describe the behavior of a program in this language. The first of which is an abstract machine. And then we look at two forms of structural operational semantics, namely small step semantics and big step semantics. So let's get started with um, a few preliminaries that we'll need in order to define the semantics of a language. Before looking into what operational semantics actually are, let's start with a question that you should always ask, and that is the question of why do we actually need this? So the question is both about why do we need operational semantics and why do we actually need to specify the semantics of a language at all. And to answer that question, let me just show you a small piece of C code and then I'll ask you what the meaning of this code is. So in this piece of code, we'll define an integer variable i and assign a value to it, let's say five. And then we're calling a function, let's call it f, and we are passing two arguments, namely i++ and i-. And now my question for you, and that's something you should think about um, maybe while pausing the video for a few seconds, is what are the arguments that are actually passed to this function f? So if you think about what the meaning of this piece of code is, there are at least two options that um, may come to your mind. One option is that the arguments are five and five. And this is what you'll get if the two arguments are evaluated from left to right. So that means at first, the first argument is evaluated, which is I++. Um, the meaning of the postfix plus plus operator is to first return the value and then increment it. So it'll return five and then assign six to i. And then the second argument is evaluated. And because this is a prefix 
operator, um, it means that we'll first decrement i, so instead of six, it's now five again, and then pass the result of that uh, decrement operation, so the value five to the function f, and as a result, the arguments are five and five. But there's also another option, which is option two, which would be four and four. And this is what you'll get if the arguments are evaluated from right to left. So if you first evaluate the value of the right argument, then um, we'll first decrement i and return the value of this decrement, um, the result of this decrement operation, which is then four. And now i has the value four. Then we move on to evaluating the left argument, which we first return, so the value four again, and then increment it again. So after that, um, i will again have value five, but the values that we give to function f in this second option would be four and four. Now you can argue which of these two options makes more sense and there are arguments um, in favor of both of those. The funny thing is that both of these two options are actually possible in C. So now you may wonder why this is the case and the answer in short is that um, C has unspecified semantics, at least for some um, parts of the language. And this is actually one of these parts. So the language, despite being used by millions of programmers and many, many lines of code, um, has some parts of its meaning not really um, defined, which essentially means whoever's implementing this language can decide whether the arguments are evaluated from left to right or from right to left. And you may even change your mind um, a couple of times while um, running a program if you want. In practice, what this means is that the compiler that is compiling a piece of C code is deciding what the semantics of this piece of code is. And if you want to try this out, you can try to compile this small snippet of code shown here with different C compilers. And you'll see that actually um, you'll get different behavior depending on what compiler you're using. Now, of course, this is not ideal because um, as a programmer, um, you want to know what your program um, is really doing when it's going to execute. So what you really want from a language is that all, or at least let's say almost all behavior um, should be clearly specified. And one way to actually do this is to formally write down the semantics of the language, for example, using operational semantics. Now, operational semantics, which we'll focus on here in this course, is just one way of specifying the semantics of programs. Just for the sake of completeness and to show you that this is not the only way, um, let's have a look at different ways of specifying the semantics of programs. So first of all, you can specify semantics both in a static and a dynamic way. The static semantics do not really say exactly what happens at runtime, but they somehow constrain the um, possible executions that a program can have. And even without executing the code, will give you some guarantees about some um, aspects of this code. And one way that I'm sure everybody is familiar with to do this is to have a type system which describes which type each variable and maybe each function has. And without executing the code, if the type system shows that the program is type correct, you know that this variable will always have a value of these types. So in a sense, um, a type system is a way to statically assign some of the semantics to a program. And then we'll also have so-called dynamic semantics. which um, come in, in different forms. Um, so one of them is called denotational semantics. We won't go into this, so this is just so that you've heard it and maybe can put it into context if you have heard about it before. Um, another form are axiomatic semantics. And finally, there are also operational semantics, 
And this is actually what we want to focus on here. So now what are all these semantics useful for? Well, they're useful for a couple of things. Um, you've seen the C example on the previous slide, but um, in general, they are useful for at least four scenarios. One of them is um, for language design. So if someone sits down and designs a language and for every programming language, someone has done this at some point, then of course that person wants to think about what is the meaning of the programs that you can write in this language. And in order to really clearly define what the meaning of the program uh, of these programs will be, you somehow have to write it down. And a typical way to do this is to specify the semantics using one of the um, formalisms that you see here. A second use case is for language implementations. So if you are the person to implement, say, a compiler or maybe a virtual machine, then of course you need to know what the program, um, what a program written in a specific language is supposed to do, because otherwise how can you implement its behavior? Then um, specifying the semantics is obviously very important for programming, because if the programmer doesn't know what the program is supposed to do, then how the hell can you actually decide what kind of program to write? And finally, and this is the reason why we are talking about all of this here in the course, knowing the semantics of a language is obviously also very important for program analysis because the program analysis, after all, reasons about the behavior of a program. And the only way to do this is if the behavior that the program will have is actually well-defined through some kind of semantics. All right, so now I've hopefully convinced you that it's a good idea to define the semantics of a language. And before we can do this, um, we need to go through a couple of preliminaries, which are basically um, kinds of formalisms that we'll use in order to define the semantics of a programming language. So let's get started with the first one, which will be about so-called transition systems. So what is a transition system? So in essence, it's a way to describe um, that you have states of a system and that you can transition from one state to another according to some well-defined rules. And we'll use these transition systems to um, describe the states of a program and describe what happens when different parts of the program are actually executed. So these transition systems um, consist of two things. One is a set called config, which is a set of so-called configurations or um, states. So states and configurations are just two terms that I'll use um, interchangeably. And then the second ingredient of a transition system is a binary relation, so a relation between two things that I'll denote with an arrow and this arrow is um, um, yeah, a binary relation over um, pairs of elements of this config set which basically means that it's describing how to get from one configuration to another configuration and this um, binary relation therefore is called the transition relation. So using this transition relation, I can, for example, say that I'm in some configuration C and then can transition to another configuration C prime. And then this is called a transition. Or if you want to use the other terminology, you can also say this is a change of state. And what we'll use this for is to essentially describe um, a step of the computation. We'll assume that our transition relation is deterministic and this means basically that 
whenever we are in some state and we can transition to another state, then there's only one other state we can transition to. So it's always well defined what the next um, state will be if there's a next state. So more formally, this means if we have a state C and we tr can transition to a state C1 and there happens to be another transition from C to a state C2, then this implies that C1 must be equal to C2. So there are no two different states we can transition to um, from state C. And to add one more piece of notation here, um, in addition to this error notation for a single transition, we'll also use the error with a little star. And this denotes the reflexive transitive closure of our transition relation. And what that means is the following. So reflexive just means that for any state or configuration, um, we can go to the same state again um, using this uh, reflexive transitive closure. So reflexive just means you can stay in the same state. And um, transitive means um, essentially that if you go from one to the other and from the other to yet another, then you can also go directly from the first to the third. So more formally, that means for all um, configurations C, C prime and C double prime, it holds that um, if you can go from C to C prime and you can go from C prime to C double prime, then this implies that you can actually also go directly using this uh, transitive closure from C to C double prime. All right, so now transition systems are one of the things we'll use here. Um, let's move on to a second point, and this is about rule induction. So what is a rule induction? It's essentially a way to define a set by first specifying some basic elements of the set and then defining rules that you can use to generate more elements of the set. And this allows you to describe a possibly infinite set using um, a short, um, well, a small number of basic elements and a small number of, of rules. So what we do here is we'll define a set, which is then called the inductive set with two things. The first is a finite set of basic elements. So these are elements that we just enumerate and say, hey, these elements need to be part of our set. And they are typically called axioms. And then the second uh, ingredient for rule induction is that we have a finite list of rules or finite set of rules to be more precise. And what these rules do is to specify how we can generate more elements given elements that we already have in the set. And the way this is um, done is that we need to say, well, if we already have this and this and this, then we can conclude to have um, yet another element. And one way to write this down is to use this bar notation where we have some conclusion which we can take if some set of hypotheses um, from, um, here called H1 to Hn is true. And you can also write down the axioms in a similar way where you um, basically say without having any hypothesis, so without assuming anything, we can conclude something, for example, that some element T is part um, of our set. So just to explain this notation a little more, everything you have on top of the bar is the hypothesis. 
In this case, this is empty. And in the case of um, the rules that we specify, there needs to be something. And then what we have at the bottom of the bar is the conclusion. So in this case, it's an element T of our set. And here it's some conclusion C. Now this may sound pretty abstract, so let's look at a concrete example to make this a little bit more um, precise or concrete. Um, so as one example, let's just look at the set of natural numbers. It's a set that everybody um, certainly knows. And actually this can be um, specified using rule induction using just one axiom and one rule where we say we have one axiom that says zero is part of the set without any um, hypothesis. So it's just an axiom. You can always say zero is part of the set of nat natural numbers. And then we'll also have one rule that is saying if n is in our set, then n plus one should also be in the set. And um, having um, this axiom, which gives us the starting point zero and this rule, which just adds more and more elements um, to the set, we have defined the set of natural numbers. Now the natural numbers are not a particularly interesting set and you wonder why we need all this formalism just to describe natural numbers. So let's have a, at a, let's have a look at a second example, which is um, about um, evaluating expressions, for example, arithmetic expressions that you may have in the programming language. So in this second example, we are also defining a set and we'll use this set to define the meaning of expressions. So for example, let's say we have an expression um, that looks like this, and this is just one possible syntax to write down an expression that adds three and four. Then what we want to do here in order to define the meaning of such expressions is to is to define a set and this set consists of pairs of ASTs, so abstract syntax trees that describe a particular um, expression and the values that these expressions have once you evaluate them. And now because there are infinitely many expressions, of course, we cannot really write down this entire set um, in a naive way, but just enumerating all its elements. But instead, we'll use um, this rule induction idea to define some axioms and some rules, which then defines this entire set um, to explain the meaning of all possible expressions. So the notation that we use to um, write down these, um, these elements of the set is the following. We'll say that um, an expression evaluates to a value n using this down arrow notation. Okay, so what this means is that the expression E evaluates to the number n, which just means this expression has the number n. Okay, now looking back at the arithmetic expressions that we have defined um, in the previous lecture, let's write down axioms and rules to actually um, specify what these expressions mean. So for the axioms, one thing we'll need to do is to define the meaning of um, very simple expressions that just consist of individual numbers. So we can do this, for example, by saying that an expression that um, just consists of one obviously has the value one and an expression that just consists of two should have the value two. And because we do not want to do this for all possible numbers, because they're infinitely many, we can actually summarize all these axioms into a so-called axiom scheme by just saying that for any number n, this number is just evaluated um, to the value that um, this number uh, has, so to n. Now this is still pretty boring because it's just about numbers that obviously have the value that they do have. Um, and now to really define what um, more complex expressions mean, we need to uh, look into um, complex expressions which are built from um, operators. 
And we do this by defining some rules, for example, a rule like the following, which at the end will allow us to say what the meaning of applying the plus operator to an expression e1 and e2 is. And we can do this assuming that we know two other things. So we have two hypotheses here. One is that we assume to know that expression e1 is evaluating to the value n1. And expression e2 is evaluating to the value n2. And if we know this, we can conclude that um, this entire expression plus of e1 and e2 evaluates to some value n if n is actually the result of adding n1 and o2. Now this only defines the meaning of plus, so we would have to write more of these rules for other um, operations, for example for minus, and if our language contains also multiplication and division and so on, then also for those. But again we can use a scheme here, in this case now a rule scheme, where we just say that for any operator it holds that if we know that some expression e1 evaluates to n1 and some expression e2 evaluates to n2, then we can conclude that op of e1 and e2 evaluates to n if n is the result of applying this operator op to n1 and e2. And this now covers all operations um, that we may have in our language. Rule induction now gives us a way to specify the elements of such a set. So we can, for example, use it to specify the meaning of all possible expressions. Now, sometimes we may want to just prove that one element is actually in our inductive set, for example, to show that a particular expression has a particular meaning. And the way um, we do this is by um, writing down a proof tree, which is actually showing um, using the axioms and rules in our um, inductively defined set that a particular element is part of the set. So what this proof tree is doing is show that an element is in an inductive set. Just getting back to our two examples, let's again have a look at the natural numbers, where let's say we want to show that 2 is a natural number. So at the very end, we want to conclude that 2 is a natural number. And now, if you look back at the axioms and rules that we have, we can just use these two axioms and rules that you see down here, right? Um, and let's do this to show that 2 is a natural number. Well, we can conclude that 2 is a natural number if we can show that 1 is a natural number. And in order to show that 1 is a natural number, we need to show that 0 is a natural number. And this happens to be an axiom, so we can just conclude this without showing any further hypothesis. Let's also have a look at a second example, which is again about our arithmetic expressions. And here let's assume that we want to show the result of evaluating a particular expression. Let's say this expression is minus of the result of plus of 3 and 4 and 1. And we would like to show that this actually evaluates to 6. Now, here's again a moment where I'll invite you to stop the video and try to write down the proof tree on your own, because only by trying and possibly failing, you can really um, check if you understand these concepts. Now let me show you um, the solution. So what we want to conclude at the very end, so this is what we write down at the bottom, is what we also have there at the top. So we want to show that minus applied to plus of three and four, and one indeed evaluates to six. And in order to do this, we now need to look at the different ingredients of this expression. So on the one hand, we have <coughs> this um, plus, of 3 and 4, which evaluates to something. And um, in order to show that this um, overall expression evaluates to seven, uh, to 6, sorry, we will have to show that this evaluates to 7. 
And then on the other side of the minus operation, we have one, which we want to show to evaluate to one. Now let's start on the right hand side. So one does evaluate to one. This was one of the um, axioms that we have described using this axiom scheme here. And looking at the other side, we now need to further um, decompose our expression here by basically showing what the meaning of three is, namely that it evaluates to three, which happens to be another axiom we can use, and showing that the value of four evaluates to four, which is yet another axiom. So overall, by applying these um, three axioms and using two rules, we can show that this complex expression um, is actually evaluating to the value six based on the inductive set that we have defined um, just on the previous slide. All right, and this is already the end of the first part of this lecture on operational semantics. So we've now looked into some preliminaries, which we'll then use in the next parts of this lecture to define the operational semantics of a programming language. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.